been translated by the reformers. And the council was certainly dominated by the Jesuits who, as I've said before, captured the universities and majored in academic and intellectual endeavours and it was by their intellectualism and their scholarship that uh, they ultimately aimed to discredit the uh, Protestant Bibles. Well, they dominated the council and it appears that the major uh, resolutions of the council uh, were, were all against the, uh, the pure Bibles, the Protestant scriptures. In his book on the history of the English Bible, author Benson Bobrick writes that the Council of Trent had declared the Vulgate not only better than all other Latin translations, but better than the Greek text itself in those places where they disagree. And it appears also that what the Council did was to, to actually take from the writings of none other than the great reformer Martin Luther and they just condemned these directly. Uh, for example, they condemned the belief that the apocryphal books, which are in the Catholic Bibles as part of the Old Testament, they condemned uh, the belief that the, that the apocryphal books uh, were not scripture and they were quite prepared to punish by death any so-called heretic who said that the apocryphal books were, um, were not scripture. Now it is true it is true that the Apocrypha was in uh, uh, the early Bibles. I have early Bibles in my office just across the hallway where you see the Apocrypha was, some people say it's not, but in the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, the Apocrypha was there. And previous to that, in the Geneva Bible, the Apocrypha was there, except in some uh, bootleg editions of the 1599 where it was left out. But mind you, uh, it was never to be accepted on the level of scripture. It was never considered to be inspired while the Roman Catholic Church makes a pronouncement that it is. But Rome and her Jesuits would not be content with merely condemning Protestant doctrine. They intended to counter the Reformation Bibles. The next step of the Jesuits was to produce their own version in English of the New Testament uh, that became known as the Jesuit Reims version because it was compiled by Jesuit scholars in the town of Reims in France and later on it became known as the Douai Reims version. The Jesuits inserted curious words and footnotes into their translation in part to justify Catholic doctrine. That's why they worked so hard to translate the Douai Reims Bible because in Matthew chapter 6 Instead of saying like Wycliffe did, like Tyndale did, like the Geneva Bible, give us this day our daily bread, they say give us this day our super substantial bread. And uh, so they change, and the Greek word is not super substantial whatsoever, but nonetheless they do that to be able to support their doctrine of transubstantiation. The Dewey Reims also countered the reformer's view that the Church of Rome had been mass murdering the saints through the Inquisition. In Revelation chapter 17 verse 6 where it describes Mystery Babylon saying she is drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. The Jesuit footnote reads, But the blood of Protestants is not called the blood of saints, no more than the blood of thieves, man killers and other malefactors, for the shedding of which by the order of justice, no commonwealth shall answer. Oddly enough, the Dewey Reims also acknowledged that the Whore of Babylon symbolized the city of Rome, but they insist it must have been pagan Rome during the time of Nero. But by far, the most nefarious conspiracy the Jesuits set forth during the Middle Ages was the gunpowder plot of 1605. The gunpowder plot came about because when Elizabeth I died in 1603, Rome was very interested to have a Catholic monarch on the throne. And the Pope at the time sent the Jesuit provincial father Henry Garnett 
uh, of England uh, two bulls which set out this strategy and uh, and urged him to ensure that uh, no one should ascend the throne of England unless they declared themselves to be a faithful Roman Catholic. What happened, of course, was that James I, when he ascended the throne, he declared himself to be a Protestant. And therefore, uh, Rome decided that he had to be removed. The instrument Rome would employ to get rid of the new king was a Spanish soldier named Guy Fox, a man whose name is remembered every year to this day as the English burn effigies of him on Guy Fox night. Why? Because Fox planted some 36 barrels of gunpowder beneath the Houses of Parliament, intending to blow up King James and the entire government of England. Out of the chaos that would follow, Rome and her Jesuit order had planned to re-establish control of the country. Well, Guy Fawkes was, um, I think, what we would call a Jesuit coagitator. He wasn't uh, a Jesuit priest, as such, to my knowledge, but he was a um, he was a professional mercenary soldier, and he had uh, fought in the Catholic Army of Spain. Fox was discovered just moments before detonating the gunpowder in what the English people clearly saw as an act of God. Fox was publicly executed, as was his fellow conspirator, the Jesuit provincial Henry Garnett. But Garnett was not the only Jesuit to be involved in the plot. At the trial, the esteemed lawyer, Sir Edward Coke, said, I never knew a treason without a Romish priest. But in this, there are very many Jesuits who are known. Garnett in England, Cresswell in Spain, Baldwin in Flanders, Parsons at Rome. So the principal offenders are the seducing Jesuits, men that use the most sacred and blessed name of Jesus as a mantle to cover all manner of wickedness. Tupper Saucy writes that during this era, the play Macbeth by William Shakespeare was actually a so-called powder play commemorating the gunpowder plot and that Macbeth is an elaborate condemnation of the Jesuits as Satanists, murderers and witches. But the year before the Jesuit plan was overthrown, Puritan leader John Reynolds had proposed that a new Bible translation be set forth. King James gave his approval and the work began on the King James Bible. Was it just a coincidence that one year later the gunpowder treason took place? Certainly an expected outcome of a successful plot would be that all work on the uh, new Bible translation which was taking place at that time, uh, started in 1604, that all that work would be terminated and terminated permanently. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, that is um, what the Jesuits intended as well. But by the grace of God, the gunpowder plot was overthrown and King James would survive to see the famous Bible that would bear his name come to completion. After nearly 100 years of laboring through the fires of persecution and bloodshed, all the while their chief object being the preaching of the gospel and the communication of the word of God in a language the people could understand, the English Reformation arrived at what many believe to have been their finest achievement, the translation of the King James Bible in 1611. Since 1526, there was a rash of Bible translation and Bible publication, and it all came to a screeching halt uh, after the King James Version of the Bible. They finally got it right. They finally, because as we follow through, Tyndall only gave us the New Testament, though he did uh, Genesis through Second Chronicles and Jonah, but they were published individually, they're never in the Bible. So Coverdale took his work and then added 
translated from the German and uh, from the Latin and makes the first English Bible. However, it's not completely from the original languages, so John Rogers comes and, and he takes all of Tyndall's work and puts it in uh, there, but he has to use some of Coverdale. And so we get done with that, and finally uh, we get to the Geneva Bible, and the Geneva Bible does all the translation from the original languages, so, uh, but, it, but it, in my opinion it's still a little rough, though it's based on the Texas Receptus and the Hebrew Masoretic text. It's very close to the King James, but I can see where there's some rough spots. So now you have the King James. It's all of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek stuff, and uh, it is accepted. In the preface to their work, the King James translators wrote to the reader, in which they spoke of those translators and translations which had come before them. They said, We acknowledge them to have been raised up of God for the building and furnishing of His church. Therefore, blessed be they, and most honored be their name, which helpeth forward to the saving of souls. And we would look to translators who, like uh, the preface to the readers, the A.V. translators sought him that hath the key of David. And they were humble men, and they were scholars, but they were spiritual men. The King James Committee deemed it important to confess their faith that the Holy Scriptures were given by inspiration of God. Inspiration refers to the author, holy men God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's the original. Concerning the Greek and Hebrew Scriptures, they said, the original thereof being from heaven, not from earth, the author being God, not man, the editor the Holy Spirit, not the wit of the apostles or prophets. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, uh, Pasagrape Theonoustos, so God gave it, the church recognized it. In their preface, the King James Committee also said, truly good Christian reader, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, nor yet to make of a bad one a good one but to make a good one better, or, out of many good ones, one principal good one. That hath been our endeavor, that our mark. They went on to say that, to that purpose, there were many chosen that were greater in other men's eyes than in their own. These men, everyone had to be so skilled in the languages that they themselves had to do the translating. This was a team technique unsurpassed either before or since. Fifty-four scholars were originally chosen, but it is said that only 47 of them actually took part. What followed over the next seven years was perhaps the most ingenious, the most detailed, the most exhaustive and systematic translation process ever conceived or carried out. So they had, uh, uh, they called them companies, they had six companies. Uh, in three different cities in, um, in London. It's called the Special Team Technique. Each of the men had two divisions, each of the teams had two divisions, the Old Testament, New Testament, in the team. And they had a very ingenious method of translating. They had every, they, they average, an average of seven men per team, just to take that as an average. They went through every word of the King James Bible 14 times. Here's how they did it. Each man in the team had to translate for himself that portion of Scripture, Old or New Testament, assigned to him. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different translations came in and they met at their team and they went over everyone's translation, which is the best, throw out the bad, keep the good. That's the eighth time they went through in the team. Then the King James was very specific. I want you to take what you have in each team and give it to the other five teams. So here's eight and five is 13 times. The other teams went into it. When they looked at things and they wanted to change some things, they didn't agree with these teams. Then they had a 14th time, at the end of the time, when it was finished, two from each of the teams, 12 men, the leading men, at the final went over everything. And so there are 14 times everyone went through. And that wasn't the end of it, because the king was very specific. 
uh, each of the bishops or leaders of the Church of England had a copy of this draft of the King James Bible, and they sent these bishops sent to everyone in their in their uh, charge who were skilled in Hebrew, skilled in Greek, to go over this and see if there's any problems that they had, and to give that information to these teams and these three different cities, uh, the six different teams. And that was the way the thing was done. Their method that there was used was two things, verbal equivalence and formal equivalence. Verbal equivalence meaning they wanted to translate Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words into English words. Not uh, messages or thoughts or ideas, but they want to have words and words wherever possible. Formal equivalence has to do with the forms of the words. They wanted to be as surely as they can of a noun in Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek, put it over in a noun in English. Pronouns to pronouns, adjectives to, to adjectives. Uh, they didn't want to have dynamic equivalence, which is add, subtraction, change of the words of God. They didn't want to change any of these things. In addition to its detailed translation, the King James Committee was instructed to keep the footnotes of the new Bible to a minimum only providing cross-references to other scriptures or brief notes on the original languages. Because of its simplicity, trusted accuracy, and the poetic beauty of the language, in time, the King James Version would overtake all the other English translations. It ultimately, down the road a little ways, replaces, not right away, but down the road replaces Geneva Bible. People had a rough time giving up their Geneva Bible because it was like a study Bible, you know. Uh, but then there wasn't any need to do that. English Protestants would become very familiar with the Bible and its doctrines. And the King James translation would come to symbolize the unified efforts of all the reformers who had hazarded their lives for the sake of the Word of God. The authorised version of the Bible is seen as almost as a unifying text for English Protestantism, um, produced in 1611. This is... This.